So for the benefit of others, I have a small uh, webinar instructions. Uh, organizers requested me to share this in, uh, information. And uh, please uh, turn off any mobile or cellular devices or place them away on a silent and vibration mode to avoid interruption and feedbacks. That's our request. And we also request you to make sure that we don't have any interruption in between. Ensure that you are only accessing the symposium through one device, not two devices, only one device. And turn off any other devices, if any, nearby to avoid feedbacks. That is another request from our side. Again, we request everyone to remain muted and keep your video off unless you are called upon to present or to post questions during question and answer sessions. Please help us in doing that. And in case if you have any problem, you should you have any reason you have difficulty with your internet connection and you are disconnected from the symposium, please rejoin through the same Zoom link you are now and make sure that you are having sustained connection. Uh, this is our request, I'm sure, uh, to have this uh, you know, symposium successful. We need your help, cooperations, and support. Thank you. So I think it's time for uh, us to start the meeting. Uh, I request uh, our Dean Postgraduate Studies to say anything if he wants to before I introduce my guest and start the meeting. Dr. Banu, do you have any message to share? Shall we start the meeting? A second, sir. I think uh, sir is trying. I think you will come back. One yeah. second. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Good morning to you. And uh, if you have any words to pass on before we start the meeting, uh, uh, we will wait for uh, 20 seconds. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nataraj Karaba. Of course, uh, the Science Week is uh, being conducted in the University of Agriculture, Bangalore. Of course, from 2014 uh, till date, we are conducting this program. The main purpose of this uh, conducting this program is uh, of course, to inspire the students so that they can come back and uh, they can able to communicate and give a good research work and they can able to discharge the uh, the agri science knowledge to the, uh, the, uh, the to the media and other things and they can able to publish the papers like that. Looking this in view, we have introduced this science week uh, only for the purpose of uh, making the students uh, to encourage them. So on this occasion, we have oh, the uh, David Akal, David G. Akal. Uh, I think uh, I request him to deliver the talk uh, on this occasion. Uh, Karba, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, again, I welcome everyone to this uh, University of Agricultural Sciences Bangalore Science Week 2020. We call it as PG, PG Student Symposium. So we are again pleased to see you all here on the day two. Yesterday, Professor Vijayaraghavan delivered inaugural address, inspired us. Today we have a special lecture by Professor Dr. David G. Heckel from Max Planck Institute, uh, Germany. He'll be talking, uh, as you know, the topic is already announced there, evolution in action. Before I request him to take over, I want to introduce for the benefit of students and uh, uh, basically, uh, it's a brief introduction about Professor uh, David. Uh, Professor Hackel is a well-known biologist who did basic education in biology and mathematics at the University of Rochester, New York. He finished his undergraduate studies uh, with a BA in biology and mathematics. He received his PhD in biological sciences from Stanford University. And uh, again, 
He worked as an assistant, associate, and full professor at the Clemson University, South Carolina. He was a Fulbright Fellow at Canberra, Australia. And uh, he was also a senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne, Australia. Then he became the director of Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology uh, in uh, Germany. And uh, he is also honorary professor at Frederick Schiller University in uh, Germany. Professor uh, uh, David Hackel has been emeritus since 1322021. And now he's continuing his research at Max Planck Institute uh, in uh, Germany. His interest is adaptations and mechanism by which uh, herbivore insects find and exploit their host plants. And he has been working since many years on adaptation and trying to understand how adaptation, interaction, other stresses and con encounter during environmental uh, you know, conditions are influencing the behavior or herbivore and interact, and insect interactions. And his uh, uh, studies are highly cited. He is also studying the genetic and physiological mechanism by which insects evolve resistant to chemical and biological insecticides, which is of very interesting to us, not only for plant protection uh, researchers, plant protection crop biologists here in the University of Agricultural Sciences. I'm very happy to announce here is that he has uh, high and uh, you know high rated publications, with more than fifteen thousand citations in high impact journals like PNAS USA, Science, Nature, and many more. With this brief uh, background, I request Professor David to deliver his lecture. Welcome to you, sir. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Can everyone see my screen? I'll assume that's the case because screen sharing should be on. So yes, thanks. Thank yes, sir. Okay. Yes, you can go ahead. Thank you. So, thanks so much uh, to the organizers of this of event uh, to allow me to speak and share with you some of my research experiences and why I'm excited to be working in science. So I'm going to be talking about insect resistance to chemical and biological insecticides and how we can deal with this problem. <clears throat> so uh, especially recently, nobody needs to be convinced that evolution is not going on Rapid evolution is a fact of life, and we can see this very clearly in the evolution of new variants of the coronavirus that has caused worldwide epidemic and chaos over the last few years. And um, it is still evolving. It is still developing new variants. These variants are being selected by the host, that is us, for an increased transmission rate and also an increased evasion of the immune system. And so the ability to rapidly determine the DNA sequence of new variants and to actually study them um, has uh, allowed us to at least follow this evolution in real time and uh, taking action to develop new vaccines and things like that. Really dealing with rapid evolution uh, in, in real time. Another example of rapid evolution is antibiotic resistance in bacteria. By now, there are several strains of bacteria that are completely resistant to the main type of antibiotic used to control them or to multiple antibiotics. They can be resistant to several different antibiotics and very difficult or impossible uh, to control. This problem also has been increasing over the past years and development of antibiotic resistance in bacteria is a real problem of very rapid evolution. <clears throat> when, when a patient takes the uh, uh, <clears throat> antibiotic to begin with, resistance in that uh, biotic population is initially very rare. Um, but resistant variants increase after antibiotic treatment and new resistant variants could in, uh, appear by mutation. And so um, the process of selection can be very fast in a patient in the hospital. I'm going to be talking about resistance to insecticides, which has developed an, a uh, <clears throat> 
a longer time frame. And over this time frame, we can see the number of documented cases of resistance. That is the uh, number of cases in which a given species is documented to be resistant to a given insecticide is still increasing over time. The red arrows show the development of new insecticides by industry. And we can see that we're running out of the new insecticides. Resistance to the old insecticides has been replaced by resistance to the new insecticides. And that means we're more or less on an insecticide treadmill where the, um, uh, we're running out of new insecticides. Uh, and uh, this is causing a problem for agriculture. Insecticides are injurious to uh, non-target organisms as well as human health. And so um, losing the ability to control insect pests though is very important to agriculture. So how do we study this phenomenon? Let me make clear about what it is, uh, uh, what we mean by resistance here. This is a genetic change in the population um, where the population gradually becomes harder and harder to control because genes for insecticide resistance increase due to selection. So field evolved resistance is a genetically based decrease in susceptibility of an overall population caused by exposure of the population to the toxin in the field. And so this means it's based on genetics. It's a heritable change in the sensitivity of a pest population, and, uh, which means if we want to study the basis of this resistance, uh, we need to study changes in allele frequencies at one or more uh, genetic loci. So genetic change in the pest is the basis of the inability of the insecticide to control it anymore. <clears throat> which means if we really want to study why this resistance has evolved, we need to be concerned about population genetics of the insect pest. And so as we learn from evolution uh, instruction, evolution is a change in allele frequencies at one or more genetic loci. And there are many factors that affect this process. There's selection, natural selection or artificial selection. That is, how much of the population are you killing by the insecticide? Gene flow or migration in and out of the selected area. Um, mutation, that is the appearance of new genetic variation and also random processes that we call uh, genetic drift. And so uh, if we would like to understand how these factors affect the change in allele frequencies, first we have to identify the, the genes, which genes are actually changing. And uh, therefore genetic linkage mapping studies are very useful in identifying the genes in, in the first place. So the sort of questions we'd be asking here are, first of all, which genes have changed in the population? <clears throat> Why, uh, what is the genetic change in the population that allows it to survive an insecticide? And then why in particular do these have a selective advantage? The third question is, does this new adaptation of the insect have an additional fitness cost? In other words, is the insect any less fit in the natural environment or the agroecosystem because it has evolved resistance to a given insecticide. We could use that disadvantage against the insect when we stop spraying with the insecticide. And finally, <clears throat> with this knowledge of the genes, can we avoid resistance or delay resistance? Can we apply the insecticide in a way that minimizes the increase of resistance in the population and uh, gives us some alternatives for dealing with the resistance population if it does appear. <clears throat> so um, 
I will give some examples of the cotton bollworm, which is a species I've worked on uh, for many years. This is a serious pest of agriculture. It attacks many pests, not only cotton, but it's in cotton that we see the development of insecticide resistance as a serious problem because cotton is one of these plants that receives very, very heavy insecticide use. The cotton farmer cannot tolerate very much damage with this important cash crop. And so uh, sprays insecticide to protect uh, the bowls from damage. <clears throat> and so um, because cotton is not a food plant, this insecticide use does not really impact the use of cotton as an agricultural product. And so uh, for that reason, really, in historical times, cotton has received about half of the total insecticide use in the world, which is an incredible burden on the environment and then also an incredible selective force on the insect. And um, this species has evolved resistance to most of the chemical insecticides that have been used uh, to try to control it. <clears throat> and so there are a number of ways by which the insect can become resistant to this particular insecticide. And the first is by changing the target of the insecticide in the nervous system of the insect. And so the pyrethroid insecticides are um, widely used because they're very, very effective. They knock down the insect very, very quickly and that's because they have a very rapid mode of action in the nervous system of the insect. When you interfere with the nervous system, you interfere with uh, behavior and you can basically knock down the insect or stop it from feeding by interfering with this uh, target in the nervous system. This is the voltage gated sodium channel. And the picture here shows um, how this protein is threaded through the membrane of the uh, neur neurons of the insect. There are many, many places where it crosses the membrane, many, many loops on the outside and loops on the inside. And what this structure does is it folds together and allows uh, ions to pass through the membrane uh, when the voltage of the, of the nerve cell has changed. This is part of the transmission of the action potential, the means by which one uh, uh, nerve cell propagates the impulse along its axons. And so by its uh, pyrethroids block this action by binding to this protein in the nervous system. And so um, what the diagram shows is mutations that have occurred in the sodium channel of various insects and when an amino acid substitution occurs in that particular region of the protein, the pyrethroid will no longer bind so effectively to the sodium channel. So in this case here, resistance um, has developed because the target is no longer sensitive to the insecticide. We call this target site insensitivity. And this is a very potent way of developing resistance because the insecticide no longer can bind to the target in the nervous system. <clears throat> so this particular type of resistance is genetically recessive. That means if you look at the mutated form of the sodium channel and re represent that allele state with a little uh, symbol R, that the little r is the resistance allele Little s is a susceptibility allele that's present in the population to begin with. And so with uh, one uh, locus with two alleles, we have three genotypes in the population. We have the homozygous susceptible SS. We have the heterozygous with one copy of the resistance allele, that's RS. And then we have the homozygous resistance with two copies of the resistance allele. Now this type of resistance is genetically recessive because the insect must have two copies of the resistance allele 
in order to be fully resistant. That is because even if the uh, insect has one copy of the susceptible allele, the pyrethroid can bind to that um, uh, sodium channel and, and kill the insect. And so both copies of the sodium channel uh, gene need to be of the resistant uh, type in order for the resistance to be uh, recessive. So I'll give an example of dominant resistance in the next slide. But what this means is <clears throat> that when resistance is originally initially rare, you cannot detect this in the population because most of the individuals are heterozygous and just as susceptible to the insecticide as the fully susceptible uh, uh, source population. So target site insensitivity is one method by which insects can develop resistance. And the thing about these pyrethroids, they're used to control a wide number of species, mosquitoes, caterpillar pests, beetle pests. We find the same mutations in the same region of the protein independently evolving in several different pests. This shows that there's a limited number of ways that this sodium channel can be modified that's still consistent for its normal function because you cannot completely delete this sodium channel from the insect because the insect will not function at all without a functioning sodium channel. So the scope for resistance evolution here is somewhat limited and we find the same mutations occurring over and over again in different species that are treated with the pyrethroid insecticides. The other main uh, mechanism that uh, insects can use to become resistant to insecticides is if they have an enzyme that can actually metabolize or detoxify the insecticide by modifying its chemical structure. One uh, class of enzymes is called the cytochrome uh, P450 enzymes. Insects have about 80 different genes for cytochrome P450 insecticide. Uh, uh, enzymes, and some of these actually can metabolize insecticides. What the diagram shows here is the chemical modification of one pyrethroid, that is fenvalerate, simply by adding the hydroxyl group to the aromatic ring on the end that's circled in red. What this does is to modify the insecticide so that it can no longer bind to the sodium channel quite so effectively. And so with this chemical modification, if it happens fast enough, it can detoxify the insecticide. Even uh, with a normal sodium channel, um, the insect is no resistant to the action of this particular insecticide. Now this type of resistance, that is chemical detoxification, is a dominant type of resistance because you only need one copy of the gene for the active enzyme in order to inactivate most of the insecticide. And so one copy of the resistance allele will confer almost complete resistance. And that's why this type of resistance can spread very rapidly in, in the population. And in fact, this type of resistance has spread very rapidly in the population due to a very uh, unique and unusual aspect of the cytochrome P450 that can carry out this reaction. Cytochrome P450s occur in gene families. That is, along the chromosome, there might be multiple copies of related genes that have diverged from one another in, in evolution. Now they're present in the genome. And this particular enzyme in the cotton bollworm that can detoxify the insecticide is a, basically a chimeric gene. In other words, it was created by unequal crossing over between two different gene copies, CYP337B2 and CYP337B1, indicated in blue and red there. And this gave rise to a new gene encoding a new enzyme where the beginning part of the gene is from one of the ancestor genes, and the rest of the gene is from the other ancestor gene. 
So this sort of unequal crossing uh, over um, does occur in nature. It's believed to be very rare, but however, it has given rise to a new form of the enzyme that is uniquely capable of detoxifying the insecticide. So when the three different allelic forms are expressed in insect cells, and they are uh, following, uh, following the generation of metabolites in these insect cells, we can see that only the recombinant form of the enzyme, that is CYP337B3, in the middle there, that's the only enzyme that can actually carry out this hydroxylation uh, reaction. And so neither of the parent enzymes, um, the susceptible versions of, of this uh, P450 gene, neither of them can carry out this detoxification. Only the new enzyme um, uh, can actually detoxify the insecticide. Even though this is very unusual, it turns out this form of insecticide resistance has spread all throughout the world, uh, including in South America, where you may know in the last 10 or, sen, uh, 10 or so years, the cotton bollworm has invaded uh, South America. It used to be restricted to Africa, Asia, and Australia, and not present at all in North and South America, but recently it has invaded South America and uh, it was discovered that they couldn't control this by spraying pyrethroids. And the reason is when it came to South America, it carried this particular CYP337B3 resistance mechanism along with it. So invasive pests can be a problem also because they're resistant to the insecticides that are used to control them. And so with more than a thousand insect samples, um, it's possible to use the PCR reaction to detect this particular type of chimeric gene. So just with a little bit of DNA from the organism, we can detect whether it has the CYP337B3 gene or not. And um, it is now very, very prevalent in all populations of the cotton bollworm worldwide. So um, basically this means that uh, when it's common, pyrethroids are no longer effective in controlling a damage on cotton. And so they simply shouldn't be used. Something else should be used because pyrethroids won't work anymore. Now these multiple problems with chemical insecticide resistance are one reason why alternatives have been sought for many years. And um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to deal with a bacterial insecticide that is a product developed from a naturally occurring bacterium that uh, was discovered to kill uh, insects. And so BT for short stands for the bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis. That's a rather complicated name. This bacterium is a very interesting bacterium because when it forms a spore or the resting form, there's a large crystal protein that's next to the spore body. That's shown in the top graph there. So um, a huge amount of protein is packed very, very densely into this crystal in the resting form of the, the spore, the resting uh, spore. These spores were discovered in dead insects independently in two places in the world. In 1901 and 1905, in diseased silkworm larva. So the silkworm is a lepidopteran, important in the production of silk and uh, dead larvae that were uh, uh, found in the colonies in Japan were analyzed. And so the insect pathologist Isiwata isolated this bacterium and he named it Bacillus uh, sato because satokin means sudden death in, in, in Japanese. A little bit later, a German biologist named uh, Berliner isolated the same bacterium from a dead flower moth. And that flower moth was in the province of Thuringia where I am in Germany. And that's why he named it Bacillus thuringiensis. And so, BT for short, 
Um, these are actually the same species. And both of these scientists were insect pathologists and they realized very soon that these discovery could be used for the benefit of agriculture to control insect pests because the action of this bacterial toxin was very, very fast acting and very lethal. And so as early in 1938, there were commercial preparations where they simply grew up in fermentation batches. Um, this bacterium allowed it to sporulate and then isolated the spores and then simply sprayed these on plants. When the, back, when the uh, caterpillar eats the plant, it ingests the spore and this then kills the insect. In the 1970s, this became very, very large scale fermentation. But what happened in the meantime is chemical insecticides were discovered like DDT, organophosphorus insecticides, cyclodienes. And those proved to be so fast acting that they largely replaced Bt as an organic insecticide in most agricultural applications. However, spray formulations of Bt are still used in forestry. For vast areas of the Canadian forest in North America, um, where they're used to control caterpillar pests like the spruce budworm and the gypsy moths, they're also used in organic vegetable production. There are varieties of Bt that will kill mosquitoes and black flies. And so these are put in, into the water and the feeding stages of the mosquitoes eat them. And it's a very good safe way of controlling uh, these uh, uh, black fly and mosquito infestations. But by now, the most important use in agriculture is transgenic plants expressing the so-called cry toxins. And so these are protein toxins and then the gene for these proteins can be put into crop plants so they can make the toxin to protect themselves against insect damage. So a great deal is known about these proteins, that is the structure of these protein toxins. They have three uh, domains. The crystal structure is known. And uh, 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 these three domains are shown in the color diagram on the right. Um, there are hundreds of these toxins known, made by hundreds of different strains of the bacterium, but they all have about the same three-dimensional structure. And so they were believed to all work basically in the same way. However, one toxin will only kill a lim limited number of insects. So they're really highly specific in, in their reaction, which makes them, um, sort of safer. So like, unlike chemical insecticides that will kill basically all insects, um, these are much more specific and have a much more targeted uh, role. So how do they kill insects? It's completely different from targeting the nervous system. Um, they, be, they have to be eaten by the insect. And so when the spore sitting on the insect leaf is eaten by a caterpillar, uh, the crystal protein dissolves in the midgut of the insect and the soluble form of the protein is a so-called protoxin. This is a very large protein and this protein itself can do no damage until it's degraded by the insect's own digestive proteases, which uh, result in a much smaller molecule, which is the active toxin. That active toxin diffuses to the site of the midget epithelium, that is the stomach lining of the insect, where it binds to many proteins in the stomach lining of the insect, and eventually undergoes a rearrangement and then forms a pore or a hole in the membrane. So these are pore forming toxins. That is, they kill the midget cell by forming holes in that, in that cell. <clears throat> and so the cell basically swells up and bursts. And so the uh, protein has to be eaten by the insect in order to be effective. And um, only certain insects are vulnerable to the action of this pore forming toxin. Uh, the cell death in the midgut lining will kill the insect eventually. It will starve to death. Or if it recovers, 
it can repair some of the damage, and then it, it, it grows much more slowly. And so larval death or growth inhibition is the eventual result of these toxins. <clears throat> so by now, uh, certain of these toxins have been transformed into uh, crop plants, most uh, uh, specifically cotton and maize or corn. And so the so-called Cry1A toxins, which are effective against Lepidoptera, have been transformed into Bt cotton. Um, and um, another type of Bt toxin, the Cry2A family, has been transformed into uh, cotton. This uh, type of toxin is active against Lepidoptera, that is caterpillar pests, but also diptera, that is uh, mosquitoes and flies. And a third type of toxin has also been put in maize for control of uh, beetle pests of maize, such as the um, uh, Western corn rootworm. And there are even uh, uh, trees, poplar trees, carrying this toxin, which have been uh, developed um, to make them resistant to leaf beetles. So these are spreading uh, uh, worldwide. And what their main benefit, especially for cotton, is an incredible reduction in insecticide use. Insecticide use on cotton, that is chemical insecticide use in cotton, has decreased by more than one half, which is a tremendous release of the pesticide burden uh, for the world ecosystem, agroecosystems. And so this is why they are widely adopted and they're, uh, uh, they're still being, in, their use is increasing uh, worldwide. Now, the very first development of this transgenic cotton was carried out by the company uh, Monsanto. And Monsanto had the exclusive right to produce this cotton. And the, uh, in the US, the Environmental Protection Agency and Monsanto was very concerned that resistance could develop to this toxin as well. And so they tried to take some lessons from how insects develop resistance to insects chemical insecticides to devise a strategy for deploying this transgenic crops to slow down the evolution of resistance in the crop. This is the so-called high dose refuge strategy for delaying resistance to Bt crops. And it makes three assumptions. First of all, Bt resistance alleles in the pest are rare. And that is actually known because Bt was very effective in killing these pests. If Bt resistance was common, then we wouldn't see it being so effective. The second assumption is that Bt resistance is recessive. That means the insect needs two copies of the resistant allele in order to survive the insecticide dose in the cotton. And then the third assumption is that individuals, the moths will mate at random, they cannot tell which is resistant and which is susceptible. So the idea is the farmer needs to plant the Bt cotton in most of the land, but then needs to set aside part of the land for a non-Bt crop, which can be cotton or something else on which insects can develop. Now the survivors on the Bt crop will be mostly resistant insects, homozygous big R, big R, which you can see is the red uh, symbols of the red dots there. There won't be very many survivors of them, but they will be homozygous resistance because they had two copies of the resistance allele to survive the transgenic cotton. Now in the non-Bt crop, the same pest is developing but most of the survivors from that non-BT crop are not resistant. They're caught carrying two copies of the susceptible allele, SS. So when those mix, most of the matings that occur will be between the green type and the red type. And those will produce heterozygotes, that is the yellow type, with only one copy of the resistant allele. That one copy is not enough to protect them against the dose in the, in the crop. And so those would be killed on Bt crops. And so this was the idea 
that Monsanto and the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency had developed. And this is how BT cotton was deployed for the very first time in the US and also in Australia. Um, this worked because there was only one provider of BT cotton, and that was Monsanto. Monsanto could make the farmers sign an agreement of where they would all agree to set aside part of their crop and not plant that on BT. And this strategy and other strategies were devised to try to um, avoid the development of resistance in BT. Now, unfortunately, this will only work in large farms. In India, where cotton is grown by millions of farmers, these have very, very small plots. They cannot afford to set aside part of their crop and not protect it from, from the insect pest. So this strategy works in large-scale intensive agriculture and other BT resistance management strategies have also been developed to try to keep insects from developing resistance. One strategy is to alternate the use over time with other insecticides. And the, this is easiest to do with BT sprays of where everybody can decide to spray with BT uh, one part of the year and then switch to another insecticide another part of the year and then switch to another insecticide the third part of the year. And by rotating through these different insecticides, the pest doesn't have time to evolve resistance to any one of them. It becomes more susceptible to the insecticide that's not treated. So this so-called rotation uh, strategy works very well in Hawaii to control the diamondback moth, but it requires that the farmers coordinate their strategy, which is not always the easiest thing to do. The other strategy is so-called pyramiding, where genes for different BT toxins are combined together in the same crop to make it more difficult for the insect to evolve resistance to all of them. And so if these different toxins have different ways of killing the insect, if the insect is resistant to cry 1AC, it won't be resistant to cry 2AB, or won't be resistant to something else. And so if these different resistance genes can be combined in the same crop, this also makes it harder for the insect to evolve resistance to it. So this is called pyramiding because these genes are sort of piled on top of one another like a pyramid. And this is the way that most of the transgender cotton is, de is deployed now in, in the US, in Australia, and in South America. So how could an insect evolve re BT resistance? Well, in this case here, one of the most effective ways is to simply delete the target from the genome. That is, mutate the target so that the functional protein is not made anymore. This is not possible with chemical insecticide resistance because deletion of the target would be uh, lethal to the insect. But now we know that the main target of um, these BT insecticides are so-called ABC transporters. These are sitting in the membrane of the protein. They have um, extracellular loops that interact with the toxin and intracellular regions that bind to uh, ATP. And so now we know that the three different main types of BT toxins, CRY1AC, CRY2A, and CRY3A, each target a different member of the family of uh, ABC uh, transporters. And so simply by deleting that gene, the insect can become resistant to that toxin. Now this does have a cost for the insect because the reason that those ABC transporters are there in the first place is because they pump toxins out of the cell. And so there's a complicated transport mechanism by which a small molecule is ejected from inside the cell to outside of the cell. This protects the cell from other toxins. In fact, the way that ABC transporters were discovered is in uh, cancer chemotherapy. So when chemicals are given to try to kill tumors, the tumors became resistant to these chemicals by amplifying the genes for their ABC transporters so they could pump out the, uh, the uh, chemotherapy out of the cells faster than it could come in. So we still don't understand exactly why 
some insects can mutate some of their ABC transporters very well. And so the fall armyworm and cry one F uh, maize in Puerto Rico develop resistance right away. However, many other species have not developed resistance. So we're still trying to figure out what it makes, what difference it makes to the insect um, uh, to delete its ABC transporters. One of the insects that is causing a problem now is the fall armyworm, which many of you may know, used to live only in North and South America, but now has spread worldwide, including in India, where over a very short period of time, less than a year, this spread through all of the regions in India. So uh, this species is also carrying resistance genes wherever it goes. And this invasive uh, species is a big problem. Let me tell you about a couple other stories about uh, Bt. Um, there was, uh, uh, brinjal is a very important vegetable crop and it's attacked by an insect, the brinjal fruit and uh, shoot borer, where the larva uh, bores into the fruit and causes incredible damage. And so brinjal typically needs to be sprayed intensively with insecticides to keep this pest from damaging the fruit. A Cry1AC expressing brinjal was developed by uh, an Indian company, but there's still a moratorium on BT and fruit crops still active in India. But Bangladesh has approved testing and release. And so the number of Bangladeshi farmers that are growing BT brinjal is increasing in these trials. This seems to be very, very effective in controlling damage by the, uh, by the borer. And the most important thing is that the farmers no longer have to spray once a day or once every two days in order to control this damage. The, uh, the crop itself controls that damage. Bt toxins also, some Bt toxins are active against nematodes. Infection with nematode worms is a big problem for animal health, but also human health. And so there's a group in Massachusetts that has found a BT that will intoxicate worms and make them easier for the host to eliminate. And they're, uh, they're preparing a probiotic where they express the protein in a bacterial cell, inactivate it, and then feed that to animals to help them cure their, themselves of the parasite infection. So BT has many uses that are now just recently being explored. We need to uh, make sure that um, they remain useful for as long period of time. So my take home messages to you today are that insect pests of agriculture also evolve. If we want to sustainably manage them, we need to understand how they will evolve resistance. Many different areas of science can make a contribution, biochemistry, genetics, physiology, and, but farmers need to be convinced that sustainable pest management is, can, is possible. And above all, society needs to be convinced of these benefits. So the social scientists out there need to find a way to communicate to the public enough information that the public can decide whether or not to accept this technology. So with that, I thank you very much for listening to my presentation and I welcome any discussion that uh, may ensue. Thank you very much, Professor David. Uh, we have uh, some uh, time for interaction with Professor David. If you are interested to ask specific queries, you can put it on uh, a chat box or you can request for uh, you know uh, time. We can unmute and allow you to ask the question. Sir, can I ask a question? It's a... Yes, please. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's a very good uh, talk about uh, the resistance mechanism governing in the VT cotton. And uh, so, and also about the effect of the molecules. So, other than this, whatever identified insecticides uh, uh, for these uh, uh, resistance mechanisms, sir, are there any other molecules? 
um, industries are developing new proteins um, that are pore forming toxins um, that are completely different from Bt. And so they're sort of prospecting and looking for other bacteria that will kill insects, finding the proteins that those bacteria make and then trying to express them in plants. And so there are at least a half a dozen different independent mechanisms to try to develop uh, new toxins that kill the insect in a completely different way uh, than uh, Bt. And so um, normally with the companies that are doing this research, don't tell exactly how it's killing the insect. They may not in fact know, but it's important for them to show that even if the resistant insect is resistant to the standard BT, it cannot resist the new toxin. And so a great deal of work has to be done by these companies to bring this to market. First of all, they have to show that they're as safe as BT and um, that needs to be done with lots of tests. Then they also have to know that expressing this protein doesn't damage the plant quite so much. And so there's going to be a long road for commercialization of these new toxins. So um, the light is on the horizon, but it may be a long time before they develop uh, anything that's just as effective as the cryoproteins. Thank you, sir. And that was, uh, can I have one question? Uh, hello? Yes, please. So, yes. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah, Shivana, please. Go ahead. Or me, uh, Shivana. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Shivana, Dr. Shivana. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, David Heckel, for your nice presentation indeed. And uh, I have a question. Are we ignored the microbial genes in the evolution of insecticide resistance in the insect? Uh, sorry, what, what was the question? The question is, are we ignored the microbial genes in the insect gut system in the evolution of insecticide resistance. Oh, so are we ignoring what? Uh, he's asking, are we ignoring microbial system? Uh, microbial during the process system. of evolution. Uh, uh, well, yes and no, because the BT <clears throat> does come from microbial systems, but in some cases it has been suggested that the bacteria that live in the midgut of the insect can themselves detoxify some insecticides. And so this is not really resistance in the insect, but uh, those bacteria can protect the insect by detoxifying the insecticide. There is a little bit of evidence for this in um, the fall armyworm in Brazil, where when uh, bacteria are isolated from the midgut of the insecticide, they can be shown to detoxify the insecticide that the insect has been eating. And there's also, um, there's a, um, uh, a soybean pest, which is a bug, which also has been shown to harbor uh, a bacterium in its, in its gut that does detoxify insecticide. So this could be um, very useful, but only in special cases because normally the microorganism is only interested in using the insecticide as its own carbon source. It doesn't really care if it's protecting the insect. And so whatever it does, it might not be enough in order to actually protect the insect from the insecticide. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank, thank you. Dr. Dr. Mohan Raju, please. Yeah, so, uh, okay, nice presentation, Dr. David. Uh, I just have a couple of clarifications, uh, like in a sense. Uh, is that the come in some insects you, you, you said like you know the toxins are removed out of the cells is that the complete toxin uh, being removed out of the cell and uh, where does these toxins go once the toxins are moved out of the cell so it is a little bit confusing because the abc proteins that move small molecules across the membrane yeah. um, those toxins are small molecules and it's ejecting them from the cells this is really independent from the action of the Bt toxin that binds to that protein in the membrane. So it really has nothing to do with the normal action of the ABC protein. The ABC protein is just sitting in the membrane. It's a binding target for the pore forming toxin. So it can actually make the pore in the membrane. And so in a sense, it's really a coincidence 
if you like, that a detoxicative uh, molecule like an ABC protein is the target of these other uh, bacterial protein that is also an insecticide. So we simply don't completely understand exactly what's going on, but what it is clear is the ABC proteins themselves are a very important target for uh, the cryotoxins. So do, do you think uh, over, the, over the years, the next couple of years, many insects develop uh, that kind of strategy to, to take out the toxins out of the body? Um, yes, but this is not very well understood with insects. It, it seems to be more potent for um, bacteria to pump antibiotics out of the body of the, out of the cell of the bacterium. And also uh, plants are pretty good at, and fungi, uh, many fungicides are actually excreted from the fungus by ABC transporters too. And so it's an effective way to protect some cells from toxins, but it's not as effective as detoxification or target site modification in the insects. So that might be why we don't know very much about how ABC proteins can also protect insects against chemical insecticides. Thank you, Professor David. Thank you. Uh -huh. Karba, I have a question. Dr. Nataraj Karba. Sir, yes, sir, you can proceed, sir. You can unmute yourself and yeah, yeah. Uh, Akal, sir, uh, as you know, the plant requires uh, nutrients, nutrients for their growth. Population is increasing. We are growing the crops season after the season, year after the year. The, whatever the native nutrients are there, they have been mined. Under such conditions, the plant is losing its immunity to the insects as well as for the diseases. Under such conditions, shall we not take uh, nutrients into consideration to fight against the insects or the diseases? Uh, yes, indeed, the plant has to be healthy to resist all sorts of uh, stress and um, developing plants that can make more use of nutrients from the soil and, and uh, not relying on chemical fertilizers is also a very important. And those are very general mechanisms for plant adaptation. And of course, those need to be supported. Um, but um, by themselves, they cannot confer resistance against a pest that actually bores into the cotton ball and uh, uh, gets its nutrition that way. So we really need a, a, a double strategy to protect, first of all, the plant against all sorts of stresses, including heat and drought stress, which is increasingly important, but also against specific insect pests uh, that will attract the plant. So we really need both. Especially the potassium and calcium, silica and other nutrients. They play a very, very role to bring the plants very resistant to the pest and diseases. That's right. And uh, they may produce toxins also. They may serve as a, a repellent against the, these uh, uh, the insects. So under such conditions, uh, plant nutrients also could be considered uh, for uh, fight against these uh, insects and pests. That, that's right, true. In, Is it in right? Fact, yeah, there, there's a, a company in India where I cannot remember the name, but they're actually developing a preparation of signaling molecules that are sprayed on the plant to induce its normal chemical defenses against the insect. So that is another strategy that is being employed. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. There are queries on the chat also, but uh, I would again request uh, everybody to be brief. Uh, Mayang, please, quick question. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I'm Mike Prata. I'm from the Department of Crop Physiology. So I have one. I want one opinion from your side. Uh, what happens if we alter the toxin specificity by using some phenomena such as continuous evolution? Uh, the continuous evolution approach is uh, very interesting. It's a way to um, have a faster way of speeding up evolution at the molecular level to increase the specificity of the toxin. I'm sure that will be very, very important. Uh, so far as I know, there's only one published study uh, that was highly visible in either science or nature a few 
uh, years ago that did uh, show, show some, some promise. <clears throat> and so um, it, it might not work for every, every toxin, but it certainly seemed to be much more effective in controlling uh, the cabbage looper, which was the species involved in that particular study. And so there are all sorts of uh, new ways to speed up basically the protein engineering of the toxin itself by continuous form of experimental evolution. So that also shows a great deal of promise. Thank you. So, Thank you, Dr. Murali Mohan, are you there? You want to ask the question? You have put on a chat box. Not idea. Yes. Next Sir, Dr. Murali Mohan, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I am there. Yeah, please. Uh, Dr. Hector, you may be aware that uh, now in India, pink bolam uh, has developed resistance to both the toxins expressed in Bolga too. Are there any ways and means to restore the susceptibility? Is it possible to restore the susceptibility against these toxins again? Um, yes, that's right. The pink bollworm is uh, a big problem. And uh, the answer is we don't know. And uh, my answer is probably not. To restore susceptibility against these, you would need to stop selecting for the resistance. But then another way to restore susceptibility is if we could find out how the ABC transporters of pink bollworm have been changed and to find out if there's some toxin that the insect can no longer pump out of its cells that could be used to kill the insect. So there has been a little bit of work mostly in China to try to screen Bt resistant strains of insects with standard chemical insecticides to see if a chemical insecticide now kills those Bt resistant insects more than it would kill Bt susceptible insects. And so avermectins, um, which is another form of uh, uh, insecticide, um, which are very useful in controlling nematodes also, avermectins have been shown to slightly selectively kill a Bt resistant cotton bollworm that have a modification in their toxin. So this is a, really the only strategy that is being uh, pursued now to try to reverse resistance to already evolved uh, Bt resistance. So hopefully it will work in pink bollworm. Hopefully somebody can find uh, such a molecule uh, that would be effective against pink bollworm. The Americans have dealt with their pink bollworm problem by eradicating it from Arizona and from Southern California. This is not something that can happen in India because the population in, the, in uh, Southern California and Arizona is so restricted. It was really easy to keep migration from coming in and to actually eradicate it with uh, uh, pheromones and also BT. And so pink bollworm in India is a serious problem and somebody needs to be working on it. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Prabhu, I think I have many requests, but I can take a couple of them and try to wind up. Dr. Prabhu, please. Are you there? Yeah, sir. Particularly regarding the uh, FA, uh, uh, at least not yet introduced in India, actually GM crops uh, uh, of maize. If introduced the GM crops of maize, is it uh, how much effective uh, against the fossil? Uh, the VIP3 uh, expressing maize may be, may be effective for a while, but it's the problem with fall armyworm is that it, it has to, uh, evolved resistance to all, all sorts of things. And so the problem with this invasive pest is that there's no easy way of controlling chemical way, Chemical control in Africa has largely not worked very well. That's because when the insect gets in the whirl of the, of the maze, it's, it's not being really affected by the insecticide. Strategies in Africa are trying to use uh, host plant resistance, but also the so-called push-pull strategy of where around the maize crop, the small farmer plants a grass that attracts the uh, insect away from the maize onto a more or less trap crop. Also by planting a ground cover plant called desmodium, this is supposed to repel the insect from laying its eggs on, on, on the maize. 
And so some sort of host plant resistance, cultural control, I think is gonna be very important um, as they are really trying to do in Africa. But the question will be, can this work anywhere else in the world? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So I will have a last question from Dr. Vijay from the Department of Entomology. It's listed as Vijay. Are you there? Vijay KL? Hello, sir. Yeah, please. Good morning, sir. So, quick question. Sorry, quick, quick, quick. Yeah, problem. thank you. Yeah, hello, sir. So if any uh, pest populations uh, develops uh, a resistance against a gene pyramided variety, so a hybrid, so what is the next uh, strategy to, to overcome the resistance? That, that's a real problem. If, if the uh, pyramided plant can no longer control the insect, there basically is no strategy. Yeah, we yes. have to wait for a company to develop a new toxin. Now, yeah. if the pyramiding is if the pyramiding plants are all put out there at the beginning, this is not likely to happen. But what has happened is first the cry when a sea cotton was planted, giving time for resistance to cry when a sea to evolve. And then the cry to a B was added. And now that gives time for the insect to evolve resistance to cry to a B. And then finally the B3 was added. So if you add these things stepwise, you really lose the impact of the truly pyramided plant. You have um, separate resistance, the opportunity for separate resistance to evolve. And so that's why I'm concerned about Bt brinjal, um, because if they only have Cry1AC in that plant and then resistance develops to that, there would be limited options for introducing another uh, pyramided gene. And so this is the vulnerability of the pyramided strategy. It has to be deployed all at once or it loses its effectiveness. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's time for us to conclude. I know, uh, uh, Dr. David, it's it's very exciting topic what you discussed for agricultural scientists here in India, as well as, uh, you know, others, biologists. It's very early morning. We bothered you in the morning. Thank you so much for coming. And every topic what you mentioned, target site sensitivity, detoxification mechanism by cytochrome P450, ABC transporters modification, is, every domain is interesting and very, very, very informative for us. Thank you so much for your uh, valuable time and innovative approaches to understand the mechanisms or evolutionary mechanisms against these kind of uh, you know, chemicals. And we have many more queries and questions being popped up or being asked here. I, what I would do is, the pertinent ones, I will type it and send it to you. It may bother you again to get some clarity on certain queries, if any. So with this, I would like to profusely thank on behalf of University of Agricultural Sciences uh, for accepting our invitation and delivering a wonderful talk. If you want to say a few words before you conclude or before we close this, uh, you are okay to say that, please only to thank you for the opportunity to talk about a subject that's very dear to my heart. And I wish you the best of success for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I hope uh, you visit next time. You said you would be visiting Germany, uh, sorry, India uh, in the month of uh, January next year. So I hope we get a chance to talk. I talk about I have one word. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Professor uh, Hackel, sir, of course, uh, your uh, language, uh, the accent was very easy to understand, uh, especially for us. Unlike others, some of the words we may not follow, but your accent is very, very easy to follow. Uh, and your topic was very interesting, sir. Uh, <laughs> of course, it's very interesting. It's very useful to our uh, uh, scientist and researcher here. As Karba told, we are profusely thanks for uh, taking out your uh, busy schedule, uh, disturbing you in the early in the mor uh, morning. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming here and uh, sparing your valuable time for the university and BFF for University of Agriculture Sciences, Bangalore, uh, Directorate of Postgraduate Studies. Uh, we profusely thank you, sir, for delivering such a very interesting topic. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, so we also would like to thank all the participants for their active participation and cooperating with us. Thank you so much, David. We are keen to listen to your naked chlorophyll story also, which I listened to you recently in Germany. So I hope I get a chance to meet you when you visit India next time. Thank you. Yeah, thank bye you bye. Have a good day. Have a good day. Sir. Thank Do you. visit to our university, sir. Please visit to our university whenever you visit uh, the, the India. I will. We will come here to our university, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. So, uh, with this, sir, uh, we are concluding this session uh, and we can move on to the next uh, parallel session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karba, Dr. Sir. Karba. Yeah. Thank you, thank sir. You so very much. nice talk. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your support and cooperation. Welcome, sir. Thank you.